Hello there! You must be here for the story. Today's story is called The Mince Pie, and it comes from my anthology, Twelve Days of Christmas Horror, and I read it to you in hope that it brings some terror to your festivities. Let's begin. The hardest part of Christmas for Santa is, without any doubt, the naughty and nice list. He loves the hard work of Christmas Eve, he loves the sparkling colours, and gosh, he loves the elves. But he does not like that list. So much so, in fact, that the tolerance for what he will accept as naughty has risen significantly and continues to rise. Mrs. Claus tells him he is growing soft in his old age, but he asserts that he has simply removed his cynicism and replaced it with understanding. No kid is ever naughty without a reason, of course. Eric, who called the kid at school fat, was being called names by his own father. Shania, who kicked a puppy, was being kicked by a bunch of girls on her estate. And dear little Horace, just three years old, had no way of knowing that you do not shout at people, as that is all he has received at home. So, regretfully, Santa had to put those children on the naughty list. Then, just as he went to leave his office, he returned and put them straight back over to the nice list. If anything, those children are the ones most in need of a gift, a moment of happiness when it comes to Christmas morning. Things are not black and white after all, so Santa allows it to happen. He allows these children to behave as such and still be rewarded. That is probably why you never hear of a child getting coal anymore, no matter how much you believe that little toad deserves it. But now, Santa has to make a decision. This child is different. He stands on the roof of 15 Evergreen Terrace in Tavistock, a small town in the southwest of England where most people know each other, by sight at least. In a town where... Should someone cause a disruption, it sends a ripple across the whole community. Well, little Billy had been sending more than just ripples. He had been sending tidal waves. To put it mildly, and use a language Santa did not particularly like, if he was deciding on the naughty and nice list, he had to set an example himself after all. The child as being a complete and utter undeniable little Ragamuffin! And there was no reason to Billy's anarchy. He had a loving home with two loving parents and a sister who had been awarded the status of head girl at school. He was raised with love, and yet he had still turned out to be a delinquent. And Santa wanted to be understanding. He really did. He wanted to say that Billy must be upset, or Billy must be having a difficult time, or Billy must not know any better. But, Rip, but Billy had really started to push his buttons. Excuse the harsh language. Santa had cut him plenty of slack. In fact, he'd cut him huge pieces of slack. A few years ago, Santa left Billy the baseball bat he was so after. Billy had been watching some American baseball on the television with his dad, and they seemed to bond over it. So Santa could not wait to acquiesce Billy's request for a baseball bat that arrived via his letter in early December. What did Billy do? He used that baseball bat to batter away at his sister's kneecaps. As if rewarding her for her perfect behaviour at school and at home, he waited until they were alone and he thwacked and he thwacked and he thwacked and he thwacked. She said nothing to her parents. His sister is kind like that. But Santa knows. Santa always knows. Then Billy grew closer to his mother over the next year. He began to enjoy sewing with her. He did not care about masculine stereotypes. No, he was happy to make fel felt puppets and jackets for his action men. So, when he asked for a craft set... Santa was happy to oblige. What did Billy do? He used the craft scissors 
to cut off his gerbil's legs. He told his parents he didn't know what had happened. They rushed the gerbil with its bloody stumps to the vet and the vet was as equally perplexed as his parents were. They wouldn't disbelieve their son. They did not understand what he was capable of. But, as the gerbil died from its terrible wounds, Santa knew. Santa always knows. But Billy seemed to do well in the year after that. He seemed to find some focus, try harder in school. Santa had been pleased with the turnaround. Billy decided he wished to paint his room. He wanted to do it all himself, too. He wanted to cover his furniture and blankets and do as good a job as possible. Well, there's nothing like a bit of manual labour to teach the child the advantages of hard work. So imagine Santa's disdain as he watched Billy force-feed the can of paint down his, the cat's throat for the vet to end up being as equally perplexed when the parents brought him the feline's corpse. The autopsy revealed paint in the body, but the parents naturally assumed the paint was ingested by accident. Maybe the cat had eaten some while Billy painted his room, the room that had been left half-finished and remained that way, as if Billy had done enough painting to keep up the pretense that he wished to use the paint for his room. The Santa knew. Santa always knows. So, this year... As Santa stands in the living room and places a wrapped-up doll for Billy's sister under the tree, he looked to Billy's stocking and paused. Oh, how he hated to be the bad guy! He loved seeing the good in the world, the positives in people, the hope in those he helped. He hated having to condemn a child to no gift, however horrible that child had been. Then he saw something that surprised him. Besides the fireplace... A plate with a mince pie. Next to it, a note reading, Dear Santa, sorry for being so bad. I am trying, really. I hope you enjoy the mince pie. Your friend, Billy. Santa read that note and felt a sinking feeling in his gut. He had judged the boy too soon. He knew it. He shouldn't have been so quick to condemn Maybe there was some good in Billy. He picked up the mince pie and wondered whether to eat it. He had come here without a present for the child. Would it not be a bit of a kick in the belly to take the child's mince pie and not leave a gift? Maybe it wasn't too late. Maybe he could go back. Maybe he could find something, anything. He took a bite of the mince pie. It was delicious. He felt so bad. So, so bad. Why didn't he? Santa paused. He felt a gurgle in his belly. He looked at the plate of mince pies and noticed something across the room. It was a bottle, reading isoflurane. Isn't that a sedative? Santa asked, right before he passed out. Santa awoke hours later. He looked around. He could hear dripping. It was cold. He was naked. Looking down, he had nothing on. His red suit had disappeared and so had his boots. His fat belly poked out, shielding his bollocks. Yet he still wore the hat. He looked up. He saw a fat little child in front of him. Billy? Santa asked. Billy just grinned, his chubby cheeks growing bigger as he did. What are you doing? Billy only said one single sentence. Thank you for my gifts, Santa. I have been waiting to use them. Billy pulled the cloth off a table to reveal three items. A baseball bat for Santa's kneecaps. Craft scissors for Santa's legs. And paint to finish him off. And, as Santa looked into Billy's sadistic, demented eyes, only two words escaped his lips. Oh, fuck! Twelve Days of Christmas Horror is available on Amazon now. I hope you have a lovely 
horrifying yet pleasant Christmas.